Hello, BookTube. I went to the Brattle Bookshop first thing this morning on a beautiful, bright, sunny, clear, cold day. Uh, those of you who are new to the channel, and there are quite a few of you <laughs> who are new to the channel, the Brattle is a used bookstore in the heart of downtown Boston. They are very old, and they are stuffed to the rafters with books. Three stories of books. The third floor I don't so much frequent. It's antique and collectible type things. But the first two floors are a great overstuffed, reasonably priced used bookstore. Every category under the sun. Uh, with stock that's rapidly changing all the time. And on top of that, there's also a sale lot next door. Not just a sale cart or two outside the front door, but a whole lot full of thousands more books. Uh, all shapes and sizes for $1, $3, or $5. I spend most of my time in the outdoor sale lot. Uh, and I did that today. It was chilly, but it wasn't it wasn't unbearable. Lord knows, I have been out there when the weather is unbearable. <laughs> when when it become when I have the whole lot to myself because it's simply too cold, even for the other diehards. And I also back in the distant past when the heat bothered me. That also there would be scorcher days, 110 degrees in Boston, where you, you if you're standing in the sunlight out there, you're you're in serious discomfort. That doesn't happen anymore, but once upon a time, I have been in that lot in all weathers. I love it. And I found uh, a bunch of books uh, that I want to show you uh, that have threads running throughout them. Some of them are connected, like gibbons swinging from tree to tree. There, Some of them are connected in ways that I'm hoping I can remember and bring out for you. Uh, and I also have props. <laughs> I brought props so that I can uh, connect these to other things. But the first thing is a Reader's Digest edition. Those of you who watch Olive's channel, a book Olive, I'm assuming that all of you do, all of you new people absolutely should. Uh, you, those of you who watch her channel will know of her fondness for Reader's Digest editions. Uh, old Reader's Digest editions of works of literature that had originally commissioned artwork. Not Reader's Digest abridged editions of books, which the, the company is most famous for. Once upon a time, for a while, they, for years, they did a whole run of beautiful naked hardcovers of classics. And they are, they are just terrific. Having a whole bookcase full of Reader's Digest editions would set you up just fine for a lifetime of reading. Uh, and I found one of them today that ordinarily wouldn't be... A choice of mine for, I, I have only a handful of Reader's Digest hardcovers. I wish I had a lot more of them. Uh, this would ordinarily not be a pick of mine, even though an old friend of mine dearly loved it, except for the illustrations. This is the Reader's Digest hardcover of The Adventures of Robin Hood, as retold by Paul Creswick. See what I mean? A naked hardcover. Just a lovely, lovely thing. And uh, I like Cresswick's retelling of the Robin Hood stories, but I don't love them. And I would probably have passed this by, except that when I looked at it, I remembered something that I had forgotten, which is that this is illustrated uh, by N.C. Wyatt. This is the exact same edition as was done by Scribner's Illustrated Classics. So that if And if I had been at the Bridal Sale lot and I had seen the Scribner's Illustrated Classic of this, I would have got it. Uh, and this is even nicer because it's, it's a, a, a normal-sized hardcover. Uh, I very much want... Look at that. There's Robin meeting Maid Marian. Look at that. How lovely that is. Uh, I very much want all of the Scribner's Illustrated Classics. There's no, no doubt about that. Uh, but I'll take it in this form. Absolutely, I will. Uh, so I grabbed it, and all of these things were free because I was using credit. I was using store credit. Uh, and this is, Cresswick does a great, a good for all ages story of uh, of telling, you know, the tales of Maid Marian and the Sheriff of Nottingham and Little John and Friar Tuck and Robin Hood. Uh, this is probably the template from which any of your popular knowledge of Robin Hood, of the, the folklore of Robin Hood, comes from. It probably comes from this. Uh, and so I grabbed it, and I, I realized once I was was getting it back here how long it's been since I actually sat down with Kresslick and read him. Uh, so I will do that, but uh, it also reminded me of something, my first prop, uh, which is a wholehearted recommendation. I have re recommended this book many times to you before. I want to recommend it again, just in case. This is Richard Kluger. This is his novel, the Sheriff of Nottingham, uh, which is a, a novelized telling of the, the tales and folklore of uh, Robin Hood, only from the viewpoint of the Sheriff of Nottingham, who in this book is not a villain. He's surrounded by villains, low and high, including a scarless land robber, a thief, and a poacher named Robin, but also the biggest villain in the thing, which is King John. 
Uh, I cannot recommend this as a work of historical fiction highly enough. I absolutely love it. And I, I suffered on your behalf to show it to you because uh, all of the books here at Hyde Cottage have recently been raised up into the sky and then allowed to fall and <laughs> just land where they will. So I didn't know where this was. Had to go hunting for it. Uh, but that's my prop for the Robin Hood book. Uh, next one is something that abashes me because I'd completely forgotten that this even existed. There was a once upon a time Barnes and Noble. Those of you who are not from America, they are the big, the, the only the only remaining big chain bookstore. Uh, and they've done a lot of things. They've done a lot of remainders. They've done a lot of reprint classics, uh, uh, that sort of thing. But they also briefly had a thing called Barnes and Noble Rediscoveries, and this was one of them. And I'd completely forgotten that. <laughs> and I, it, it, the minute I saw it, I realized this is the version of this book that I want, and also that I want to read this book again. This is American Renaissance by Harvard's own F.O. Matheson. Uh, and look at that. I, I admit, the Grant Wood cover, that is Young Corn by the great artist Grant Wood, and that the, the cover sold on me on it as much as anything else. Most of the times that I see this, it's in a very flimsily made trade paperback. This hardcover will do just fine for a rereading. And this is Matthiasen's uh, study of basically, I mean, the heart of it is a, the years 1850 to 1855. And the tremendous literary outpouring that happened in American literature at that time, The Scarlet Letter, Moby Dick, uh, Leaves of Grass, House of the Seven Gables. Uh, and he concentrates also on a small cast of characters. Thoreau and uh, Emerson, uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne, Herman Melville, and Walt Whitman. And the that, I, I haven't read this in a long time, but when I did, I remember being a little uncomfortable at how close it comes to literary criticism, to formal literary criticism, which is just the death of interest. Um, it doesn't ever cross that line. It remains very, very wonderfully written. Uh, but when I read it back then, I remember thinking, this is one of the best portraits of Hawthorne that I've ever read. I've read every biography of Nathaniel Hawthorne. It's also a fantastic portrait of Emerson, who is a tough figure to pin down. He's a tough figure to do as well a job as this book does. Can't wait to read it again. It's such an attractive hardcover. Uh, I don't have any props for that one, but keep in mind, uh, the one of the things in the back of my mind was, how many of these am I going to keep forever? How many of these are coming into this room, specifically onto that bookcase back there that I'm leaving blank for the occasion? Uh, this next one is a big fat work of history uh, that has a, a thread. It has a thread. It's one of the threads that will be running throughout here. This is Taking on the World, Joseph and Stuart Alsop, Guardians of the American Century. It's by Robert uh, Mary, and I don't know who came up with that subtitle since both the Alsop brothers were dead. When this book came out, I'm assuming that they didn't come up with that title. But boy, would they have loved it. <laughs> boy, would they have loved it. Uh, this connects with something that we mentioned just the other day about um, Washington, D.C. society matrons, society hostesses. Because you absolutely needed to have, for forever and ever, for decades, you absolutely needed to have one or both of the Alsop brothers at any soiree that you were having. You absolutely have to do that. Uh, the I made an oblique reference in that earlier video to uh, the fact that I knew a couple of Washington, D.C. society matrons. And one of the ones that I knew, unfortunately no longer with us, uh, she had a very droll wit about her. She used to say, well, I don't much like gin, but I can't not have it at my parties, now can I? In reference to the Alsop brothers. Uh, and she was also known to quip when people would, when, when strangers, visitors to, to the South, would say, well, who are the greatest Washington society matrons? She was was known to quip, are we excluding the Alsops? <laughs> uh, Joe and Stu Alsop made their name by becoming influential. I mean, they were part of the kind of ruling elite of the country. They were, I don't remember the exact Byzantine details, but first cousins to President Roosevelt and a bunch of other people. Uh, but they made their name writing a, uh, for the Saturday Evening Post, which at the time that they were doing it was a massive figure on the landscape of periodical publish, uh, publishing in America. Political columns, taste-making columns, cultural observation columns, it got them into uh, the position, a uh, position as one of the Hollywood social circles uh, resident uh, intellectuals. 
Uh, and I had, I have another book by them, a fantastic book, another one of my props, the Georgetown set. Uh, and th now I have the, the, really the two works that I think I'm going to need <laughs> on these two figures, two, the two works that uh, will recapture a lot of this era for me. Of course, those of you who have been with this channel for a while will know that I have a uh, soft spot uh, for Washington, D.C. I lived there for a while and got to know its social life to an extent that I've hardly got to know the social lives of any other place where I've been. Uh, a totally different kind of Washington, D.C. If you know the social life there, at least back then, you knew a different Washington than most people ever saw, and it was a Washington worth knowing. Uh, but also, those of you who have watched this channel for a while will guess at least another one of my the connections of my interest with these two figures, which is their connection with the Kennedy White House and Jackie Kennedy and Jack Kennedy. So uh, I don't think I've ever read this book. I think that I've read other things by this author. I'm not sure that I've ever read this. Uh, it's not uh, springing to mind, but we'll see. Uh, but I do want to read you uh, a bit here from the end of the author's acknowledgement section, because it's very touching. And I don't know if you're ever going to see this book, so I want to share it with you. Uh, uh, the author writes, Finally, a prayer of peaceful respite to my, for my mother, Carol B. Mary, who, before her death in 1993, spent several months toiling away in the documents room of the Library of Congress, gathering material from the vast Alsop papers. I shall forever cherish the memory of her expression of wonderment as I would drive up to the Madison building on Independence Avenue to pick her up for, in the afternoon, and she would climb into the car and exclaim, You simply won't believe what Joe did today. <laughs> That's just wonderful. So I'm very happy to have it. These are things that I will be rereading in December uh, or reading for the first time. And then uh, we move to uh, another another connection. This one is the most visceral for me, the most direct, uh, and I have another prop for it. And the prop is uh, directly connected to the author of this book. This is To the Harbor Light by Henry Beetlehoff. This is uh, a series of... Um, sort of a ponderings, there is our author and his best friend, uh, a series of ponderings about li late in life. Uh, the author wrote this when he was in his uh, late 70s, early 80s. I don't think he wrote many books after this. I think maybe one. Uh, forever and ever, he was the editor of the Martha's Vineyard Gazette. Martha's Vineyard is an island off the coast of Massachusetts. It, it was It's a, now a popular vacation spot. And uh, the Martha's Vineyard Gazette is an old-style broadsheet newspaper that comes out once a week uh, and ha has all the usual stuff that you would find in a small-town paper. It is the greatest small-town paper in the world, in my admittedly biased opinion. It has nature columns, gardening columns, bird sighting columns, local news, tons of obituaries, and an editorial page uh, that also includes book reviews. And it has been the same. Uh, Henry got was given the Martha's Vineyard Gazette as a wedding present by his father and stayed its editor for I don't even know how long 50 years um, and w I know the vineyard backwards and forwards I know it in all seasons in all weathers in all moods and in all years and many's the time when I was there when I saw a, a site that for a long time was very familiar to vineyarders and that was the site of these two slowly and wobbly walking along the road. I think this this volume is illustrated yes by Donald Carrick. That is the image that I'm that I'm talking about. Uh the two of them just wa walking down the road, down down the lane side by side as always, never in a hurry as always. Uh Graham the the uh the <laughs> the beautiful collie uh had a wobbly walk even as a young dog with crossing legs as as walking uh and uh many is the time in that long history of mine with the vineyard that i would stop to talk with with henry about all sorts of things about the the news of the day about the politics of the day about books especially about books and writing and there were there were a number of times where he would just gently say well I, why don't you write something for me why don't you write something for the paper uh for the paper and, and uh, I always declined. At the time, I was thinking, no, I want, I want to be, I don't want to be in the book reviewing world. I want to be closer to that. I want to be handing books to people and selling them to people, talking about customers directly 
instead of opining from some sort of perch. So I, I always politely declined while I was smooching liberally with his dog. Uh, and uh, time passed and long time. <laughs> and and uh, I got this in the mail. I get the Vineyard Gazette in the mail every week. Uh, and the reason why I do, I have not paid for my subscription. My subscription was comped to me. And the reason why is because I am now writing book reviews for the, for the Vineyard Gazette. There is my latest one. Uh, I don't know if you can make that out. There is my latest one. It's a book called Everybody Lies. It's a thriller. And it's in the middle of the opinion section that I was talking about for a feature called The Vineyard Bookshelf. Uh, and my editor at The Vineyard Gazette is wonderful. Just fantastic. And my relationship with the Vineyard Gazette is wonderful. He, he sends me, whenever he gets a book, he just fires it off to me. Uh, but I can't help there being a tiny bit of melancholy in it because, uh, oh, well, hello. You're not a graceful collie, are you? No, you're not. <laughs> you're not a graceful collie. You're not graceful at all. You have other qualities. You're intense. Graham was never intense. <laughs> if you'd have told me back then that this was in my future, I would not have believed you. <laughs> I would not. I would not have believed you. <laughs> if you had told me back then, someday you're going to be talking to a device the size of a playing card that is a phone and a stereo and a library and a camera, uh, and you're not going to have any beagles at all, much less, not gonna, you're not even going to have one, much less a team of them. Said you're going to have a, a miniature schnauzer. I would not have believed you. Uh, so that that has come around full circle now. The 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 fact that uh, the fact that these two things have come full circle. So that is the closest, the most visceral thread that runs throughout these books. Uh, then the next one uh, is a thread that connects us with <laughs> with this book with uh, the Allsop's Uber Ollie, so whatever the title of this thing is, they made their bones writing for the Saturday Evening Post back when it was a big deal. It wasn't just your grandmother's magazine. Uh, and so did this author. This, this next, the author of this next book also uh, broke into the world of literature and having an audience and whatnot through the Saturday Evening Post, and that is Kenneth Roberts. And this is his novel, Arendelle, uh, which is about... Uh, <clears throat> Colonel Benedict Arnold and the, the, uh, the disastrous overland route that he took from a spot in Cambridge Common that I could point out to you the next time we're free to visit, all the way up to Quebec, all the way up to Quebec City, in what was hoped to be the prong of, an, of a two-pronged invasion of Canada, of the British co possessions in Canada. But much like uh, Gentleman Johnny Burgoyne uh, uh, on the other side, um, Arnold came up against the the rigors of the wilderness, in this case, the Maine wilderness, <laughs> where the, they had to engage in portage, they had to engage in whitewater sailing, and the, none of his men, he went up with 1,100 men, I think he, they reached their destination with half that number, and the half that reached their destination was nearly dead, with starvation and mosquito bites and exposure and whatnot. Uh, it was, it was, it was, it's a disastrous thing, it's a fantastic story, and Kenneth Roberts... Uh, with the pure instinct of a storyteller, knew that, zeroed in on it, and makes this a a jolly company novel, much like Robin Hood and his Merry Man. This is a jolly company novel, a whole bunch of different outsized characters, and the story of that arduous trek up north. Uh, now I wanted to read you just a bit of the beginning of this uh, to give you a sense of, because Arendelle, Rabble in Arms, all, all of Kenneth Roberts is out of print. And I, Mark, Mark Richardson of Richardson Reads and I lament that fact all the time. In fact, I think when Colonel Arnold and his men were making that arduous trek through the Maine woods, I think at one point they passed by the porch of the old farmhouse <laughs> up in what is now Vermont. And I think Mark Richardson held up a beer can, pulled the tab and said, cheers. <laughs> in one way or another. Uh, I want to read you, uh, this is told by uh, one of the Nason family, Stephen Nason. The Nasons were uh, a family that Roberts returned to over and over again in his fiction to sort of personalize the history of Maine. 
And he wants to set the record straight on a whole bunch of things that he has heard. He's now an old man. He wants to set the record straight on a whole bunch of things that he has heard about that expedition that are all wrong. And he says, above all, because of the lamentable occurrences at West Point, the countryside is filled with men of mighty hindsight who speak with scorn of Colonel Arnold, whose boots they were not fit to shine, and belittle or ignore the expedition to Quebec. That achievement, to my way of thinking, is unequaled in all the many histories of many campaigns that my grandson has obtained from me from the, the library at Harvard College, and that I have read carefully during long winter storms when the breakers roar on the ledges and beaches, and the pines behind the summer camping place and the Abenakis are frosted with snow, calling to my mind the gables of Lower Quebec, and the bitter days through which we lay and watched them against the snow-plastered cliff beyond. I have small skill in writing being more fitted for wood trails than for a knee-hole desk, and my hand better shaped for the handling of an axe than for anything as delicate as a pen. Nevertheless, I am constrained, as Colonel Arnold was given to saying, to have a shot at it, so as to set matters right. If that's right on page one. If you don't get a sense from that, that you're going to be in fantastic storytelling hands for the whole course of this book, then you need your senses recalibrated, because that's just what is, what is happening. And you saw in a relatively recent Brattle Hall that I found. Uh, that is an N.C. Wyeth cover right there. Same, uh, that's another thread. N.C. Wyeth illustrated the Robin Hood book. Uh, I Just a little while ago, I found Rabble in Arms, uh, also with an N.C. Wyeth cover, uh, probably from the same person in the same hardcover, the same kind of dust jacket. Uh, but that's, it's been even longer since I reread Arendelle. So that's great. That's fantastic. Then this next one is a bit of skullduggery, and it's a U.K. cover. I know this book. I've read it. Uh, but I had never until now seen the UK hardcover, the Jonathan Cape hardcover. This is by David Yallop. This is In God's Name. And it is his searing expose about the death of Pope John Paul I, who was Pope for 33 days and then was found dead at his desk. And the Vatican immediately put out a story saying that he had died of a heart attack, basically, a coronary infarction, uh, and let it go at that. And hoped that the truth would be buried, literally, with the evidence. Uh, and Yallop was contacted by a whole bunch of people inside the Vatican who didn't believe that story. Who, con who conjoined it with the fact that the cardinal who became Pope John Paul I hadn't had much in the way of serious health problems. Certainly not anything to cause a cataclysmic, immediate, overnight death. And also that he had made known his intention to shake things up at the Vatican, especially at the Bank of the Vatican. And had therefore amassed against him some powerful enemies. I remember reading this when it first came out and not being 100% convinced. Uh, and I'm wondering if I'll feel if I'll feel more you know more favorably inclined now. Can't wait to dig back in. All of these things are going to be reread, read or reread this December. Uh, and then uh, we'll finish up with uh, a book by David Carroll that I just love. In a long time ago on a library tour, I showed it to you, but I had a trade paperback. And now I found, I found a beautiful hardcover with a plastic covering. And this is Swamp Walker's Journal. And I had previously this trade paperback, which I will now get rid of because I now have uh, this hardcover, which is written by the author. He's from New Hampshire, and he writes, he is a, a huge, excuse me, a huge fan and a poet laureate of wetlands, of m bogs and marshes. And uh, he's also a first-rate artist. Just first rate. Look at how look at how this book starts. Uh, let me show you the little the little uh, panel that's right at the beginning, the very first thing. Yeah, look at that. Look at how lovely that is. Right on top of a chapter. Uh, and he in this book and a couple of others, but this is my favorite one. He writes about that. He writes about that love, which has always been true. It's, he's always been in love with wetlands, uh, with swamps and bogs and marshes. Uh, and he, I want to read you a bit where he starts off. Uh, because it, it shows you uh, uh, something of his eloquence. Uh, let's see here. This, uh, no, wait a minute. <laughs> Hang on, I'll find it. Uh, yes, it is my delight and good fortune to have spent a large measure of my life in wetlands. For close to five decades now, from an intuitive boyhood bonding to a more scientific perspective in later years, I have moved among vernal pools, marshes, swamps, floodplains, and peatlands. Later science has done nothing to diminish earlier poetry. Answers only unlock questions, and specific knowledge only deepens the mystery of the Earth's landscape and life. As a boy, I knew ponds and swamps and streams, 
If the word wetland had been coined, it was of a rare or specialized usage, and I had never heard it. Today, one can hardly glance at a newspaper or television program without encountering the term. Magnificent even in their present broken and besieged state, wetlands have become areas of intense human debate. And here we're told on the dust jacket uh, that uh, the author has stayed in touch with individual turtles for 20 years, watching them dig into hibernation in the winter, greeting them as they emerge in the spring, following them as they breed, feed, and roam through the warmer months. He knows frogs and snakes, bears and beavers, muskrats and minks, dragonflies, birds, water lilies, pickerel weed, cattails, sedges, and everything else that swims, flies, trudges, slithers, or sinks in uh, or sinks its roots in swamp, marsh, or bog. In other words, the author is Caleb, <laughs> who once had a booktube channel. Uh, and it, uh, this is going to be an absolute delight I have to reread. I haven't read this in forever. And it's going to take the place on the shelves that this one was on. Uh, so that I don't need I don't need two copies of it. Uh, and that was it. That was my brattle trip. Uh, full of goodies, uh, old and new. I, wanna, I want to uh, finish up by reading you from uh, To the Harbor Life by Henry Beetlehoff. Just a bit uh, of this. Just... Uh, so that I can, I have the pleasure of reading him uh, on this channel. I want to read just the beginning of, let's see here, yes. Long experience has taught me, I'm not going to read it in, in his New England device, I'm not going to do that. Uh, long experience has taught me that I needed a dog. The open land and shore, the country seasons demand a large dog and a collie is just right. So it was Graham I brought home from the Cape at the age of a few weeks, a downy pup with a white muzzle and a thin white blaze on his forehead, given to crossing his legs as he walked or stood, and with an endless interest in all the natural and human worlds around him. I needed him for companionship and to make sounds in the house at night. I needed him for the walks we were to take each morning all year to the lighthouse at the end of the causeway. We stand there as the sun appears, a red ball in an orange sky, Attending to the sequence of divine events, I could make myself aware of the turning of the earth toward the sun, our stationary star and lamp. I could feel myself a passenger upon the bending rim, so slowly being advanced along with Graham, a blue heron in the lagoon, the gulls atop the wharf spile, or more aptly, as against the sightseer of recurring dawns. Once the red rim of the sun became visible, our, our motion toward it seemed to undergo a quickening. The close prelude to what we call sunrise gave way to a rapid fulfillment. Up, up, it seemed to come, swiftly up now, and the roofs and treetops of the town were gilded as Graham and I walked back along the causeway. Uh, and you might get, that's right at the beginning of the book, you might get the sense that this is uh, highfalutin, but it is not. <laughs> this is an author who had two feet firmly planted in the ground. As uh, we return to this uh, theme where he writes, The Light of Eternity. I have no idea what it is or how to seek it. I can only proceed with my daily assignments, beginning with the morning walk to the lighthouse, the glow of which guards one nocturnal round at a time. Graham and I were up at five this morning, when the stars guided us as surely as if we had been mariners at sea, although we knew the way well enough and did not go into any primitive country until we entered Bob Brown's moor. The air had cleared from yesterday's rain, the wind gusted heartily from the northwest, and I was pleased to have put on an extra sweater. We saw no one until we reached Main Street, on the way to the office where the Vineyard Gazette will be printed today, for this is another Friday. There we crossed courses with Henry Delaney, who was bound on some early errand, and exchanged our first good mornings across the street. No other sign of dawn but Orion, paling in the northern sky. Orion had, something, had seen something that as yet we hadn't, and wouldn't, for another hour longer. Uh, so... The, this was a wonderful shopping expedition. Of course, the question that hangs over it all is how many of these are keepers? How many will go on that bookcase right over there, the one that I'm leaving empty in order to fill with keepers in the course of the next year? We shall see. I think there are a couple of likely candidates in this batch, but you never know. <laughs> so I'm going to wrap this up for now, uh, but I'll be back. Thank you, book two.